Greetings in the name of Christ, everybody. I'm Lillian Daniel, Michigan Conference Minister, and I'm so pleased to see so many people joining us um, from around the Michigan Conference or from wherever you are. But this is our monthly leadership lunch where we invite pastors, lay people, um, generally uh, directed toward our United Church of Christ clergy, but everybody is welcome. And I am so excited today to introduce you to um, an author who is well known in many different ways. Uh, Tony Jones is one of those rare academic theologians who can write or speak for any audience. Um, he's written on Augustine, on the atonement. I highly recommend as an adult book study, his book on the atonement. It's called, Did God Kill Jesus? How's that for a great title? And um, and it really works well in book studies, et cetera, in churches. Um, I've known Tony for a long time. Maybe he can tell you a little about that. But um, I had him at my church in Iowa before I came to be the conference minister here, talking about the atonement and visiting with folks. And I am so excited that he has a new book out called The God of Wild Places, Discovering the Divine in the Untamed Outdoors. Tony, welcome. Lillian, thank you. It's great to see you. So uh, tell us in a really quick blurb uh, what you think this book is about. Well, the tagline of the book is a pastor walks out of the church and into the woods in pursuit of the God he's lost. Um, so, I mean, Lillian, as you said, you and I have been friends for a long time, and you know uh, a lot about my personal life and a lot about the travails that I've been through. And uh, I mean, I guess I, there's probably a lot of clergy on this Zoom, and uh, I think maybe we might if we took a vote, have majority consensus that the church, while often good at taking care of hurting and broken parishioners, has a little harder time taking care of hurting and broken clergy. Lillian, can I get an amen? <laughs> yeah, I I feel you. That's part of, I think, my yeah. call to go into conference ministry is to hope to do better with that. Yeah, so I went through really, really hard times. The church did not treat me particularly well. I mean, with the exceptions of individuals like you, Lillian. I mean, I I had friends stick with me, but in in general, uh, the church didn't quite know what to do with me as kind of a somewhat celebrity pastor, author kind of person who then went through a divorce and custody fight and stuff like that. And I just felt pulled more and more to outdoors pursuits. And as an adult wasn't something I really grew up doing, hunting and fishing and canoeing in the boundary waters and stuff like that. But I've I've taken to that more and more, and it's become more and more the center of my spiritual life. So the book is really my kind of memoir. I mean, is it a memoir? We can talk about that if you want. Um I've I've I'm highly influenced by my friend Barbara Brown Taylor and uh, her writing, and she coached me a lot in this, which we can talk about. I let me tell you one quick story, Lillian, that I think you'll like. Um, and I told the story last night at the book release party, which was a lot of fun. Um, I, you and I, Lillian, talk a lot about writing. A lot of the times when you and I jump on the phone, we're talking about our writing projects, our agents, our search for agents, how frustrated we are with our literary agents. You know th these these kind of things that writers talk about and. I, I was between agents and let my agent go. And then I got a new agent who took me on, even though my prospects were not great because my last books hadn't done that well. And, but he took a chance on me and, but we were trying to kind of find a narrative path for this book that I'd been working on for a decade. And he said, I'd like you, I want you to reread some Barbara Brown Taylor because she has a way of writing books that are they're not really memoirs, but they're based in her experience. So I start rereading, like I'm reading Learning to Walk in the Dark again for, I don't know, the third time. And I re and I reached out to Barbara and jumped on the phone with her. And I'm like, I'm my agent told me to read your, I'm reading. Here's the thing, so different from all my past books. You write this stuff and you never say should. You never say you should do this or you should, you should 
learn to walk in the dark this way. And she said, this is so, she, this is so she's like, oh, Tony should. That's how men talk. That's not how women talk. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. After I pulled the knife out of my chest, because I've written a dozen books telling people how they should think about God, how they should pray, how they should this, how they should that. Now I'm like, okay, time for a new Tony, you know, like, well, you know, yeah. well, you know, the expression in writing is don't should all over yourself. Right. Right. Or, or it's, your reader. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, what's hard I think is, especially if somebody is a preacher, um, there is a component that we think we're supposed to should all over ourselves or the congregation yeah. at some point, or we haven't done our job. But we dress it up in phrases like let us now or might we now as if it's a real question, you know, might we perhaps consider the poor like everyone knows the answer is yes. Um, So but Barbara Brown Taylor is one of those rare pastors who doesn't do that. And one of the gifts she has is you feel like you're walking along, sitting on her shoulder. And even though, you know, she's a trained Episcopal priest. Um, you feel like you're discovering things for the first time with her, like you're this little bird on her shoulder uncovering things. And I think that kind of second naivete is the kind of thing you're doing in this book because you are highly educated with PhD and you've done so many things in the emergent church, a lot of groundbreaking work on um, youth ministry. You were early out on social media and teaching clergy how to do things like tweet, you know, back when that was a thing. You've done so many things, um, but it's fun to go on this journey with you in this book because you weren't raised as a hunter and you discover this as an adult, right? And that's kind of interesting. And you kind of rediscover God uh, while doing it, while killing stuff, while killing stuff. (laughs) So tell us about how how you found God killing things like that beautiful duck behind me yes that duck is beautiful and would taste very good too um yeah i i I, one of the opening stories in the book is and a lot of us who are clergy know this experience of i just had i was going through a hard time i was a i was a young pastor i was struggling i was in a terrible marriage that i couldn't admit to myself uh i had a lot of anger one night um I was at the youth committee meeting, you know, which is I, I'm a whatever, a 29 year old newly married youth pastor. And the youth committee is, um, uh, you know, a bunch of parents, well-meaning parents who, who are doing a three year stint on the youth committee to help me and, you know, help put on the confirmation banquet and help raise money for the mission trip and this kind of thing. And I don't even remember what happened. But I blew up. I mean, I blew my top at a meeting. I lost it. And they were very, I think, generous with me in spite of my immaturity and my anger. And of course, my anger, as we now know, is we grow, we age, we realize um, I, my anger was coming from somewhere else, you know? Well, one of the guys on the youth committee named Doug... Uh, about 15 years older than me, he he walked me to my car that night. I remember he and a woman named Linda, um, to these two of these two parents, walked me to my car and just tried to calm me down. It's gonna be okay. Doug and I ended up having breakfast a couple days later. And then I started hearing his story that he's a he, he's a recovering alcoholic uh and drug addict, that he um had a lot of anger issues and had gone to anger management classes as part of his recovery. And he became a real mentor to me in that. And then he asked if I wanted to go duck hunting with him and I'd never gone. And I tell the story in the book, you can read that um, we were deep in Lake of the woods one night. We got lost on the way back in the middle of a storm. It was a very, very harrowing experience, but I, had this incredible sense of peace in the midst of a literal storm. You know, there's all Jesus calming the storm illusions we could make here. I suppose if I were preaching about it, that's what I would do. But I just know that something happened to me there in that duck boat that I loved. And um, then I didn't really hunt for, you know, 10 years. But finally, that marriage collapsed in 
a great explosion where shrapnel blew out and damaged a lot of other people too. And um, I something drew me back into these outdoors pursuits. So that's that's what I ended up doing. Yeah. Well, I love that chapter in the book where you you talk about really having to surrender. And some of that is 12 step language, but also deeply religious or spiritual language. And yeah. that you, when you were out there, you know, you're lost in this boat with this guy and you have to you have to surrender to something more powerful than yourself. And you had led kids on countless wilderness boundary waters trips. Surely you'd you'd been vulnerable in this way before. What was different? Uh, I think as you know, you're right. But but it's a different thing that we all know who've led trips like that. I mean, you're a kayaker, you know, it's one thing to take a group from church kayaking and you're the leader and suddenly you're in charge of, you know, the first aid kit and making sure no one gets lost and everyone's got their PFD on. It's not, it's not a particularly contemplative experience when you're leading it like that. It's different when you just jump in the kayak and go out on your own and spend half a day on the water by yourself. So as my, as my, career in pastoral ministry and came to an end. I just was doing more and more of that stuff alone or with smaller groups. I wasn't in charge. Uh, I was relieved of the burden of leadership um, by the internet. And, uh, and so I had more time, I think, to be more reflective in the outdoors. And then, as you know, because you and I share this in common, the process of writing a book about it, especially taking 10 years to write about it, really caused me to reflect on it in ways that I I hadn't when I was in the midst of it. So I would look back on a moment like being in the duck boat with Doug, or I read last night at the, at the book launch um, a passage from chapter seven where in another boat, I'm in a fishing boat with my three little kids in 2012, and we get caught in a storm. And um, the, the fear I felt in that storm and what I learned from that. In the, you know, in the moment, you're not doing a lot of reflection. You're trying to survive and not watch your kids drown. But later, as, it, as I processed it, and then particularly the process of writing about it, Help really helps me to figure out what what's the deeper meaning of it for me. So Tony, you know, you referenced this this thing you went through and you got divorced, and I don't know if people really know it or you want to say a word about it, but it was kind of like you kind of got canceled, right, by yeah. a lot of your friends in the Christian world. You had been writing books and speaking, and then this kind of messy divorce spilled out into the world. I think and. Is that a fair way to describe it? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, it I mean, it, not, not canceled by me, by the way, but no, you were, you were Lillian, an incredibly loyal friend. And I have a handful of friends in the church world who were loyal. They were undeterred by the online criticism and you're among them. I, I can't say that everybody in our, we're in the group where you and I first met the, what you refer to the Yale faith and chicken project uh, was <laughs> have not everyone there was the same, but you were. And yeah, I mean, it was a divorce in 2008, 2009, and then it kind of calmed down. And then it kicked really back into high gear in 2015 because I ultimately went for full custody of my kids, which I got full custody of my kids. In the book, I describe it as like, when those of us from the center of the country, you know, go like, go to the ocean for vacation, and you like get in the waves and you're not really used to the waves and you know, and then you kind of get hit by a wave and maybe it not, I, I refer to it in the book as like the first, the first wave kind of hit me and knocked me to my knees and I kind of was getting my bearings back. And then the second wave, I think I write it, um, dishwashered me, you know, how you get churned up and you get thrown. Yes, that. So the second wave and hit, and you'll remember this because we, we were friends, but just to get you know, give people a sense of it, it happened nine years ago when my last book came out, Did God Kill Jesus? This book on the atonement. And I was actually supposed to preach. It, it came out the week before Palm Sunday. And then I was scheduled to preach at Mars Hill Bible Church in Grand Rapids, the Rob Bell's church, you know, at the time, one of the premier pulpits in the country. I was going to preach the Palm Sunday sermon at Mars Hill and then fly to New York and do all media for a whole week during Holy Week, 
including going on the O'Reilly factor to debate Bill O'Reilly, who had come out with a book called Killing Jesus. And we were going to debate why Jesus was killed, you know, why why Jesus died. And uh, yeah, it all came unglued that week. And uh, I remember getting a phone call from, some of you may know him, from West Michigan, Kent Dobson, who continues to be a dear friend of mine and has since left ministry and kind of left the faith. But he called me in tears and said, you were, we're rescinding the offer for you to preach. And so I crestfallen, destroyed. I flew to New York and sat in a hotel room all week waiting for the publicist to send me out to do media, none of which happened. So it was a tough time, as you remember, um, for being my friend at that time and hard to keep my head on straight, you know. Um, but I'm sure a lot of people on this Zoom uh, have had hard times that have thrown us sideways, you know. And um, you recover over time with friends and with faith. And, you know, as you, you know, my wife, Courtney, she's an incredible human being. And a big part of the reason I even survived all this is because of Courtney. Uh, so, yeah, it was really, really hard. And I do write about it in the book. But again, it it's it. um it, it's with friends who've written memoir type things like you and Lauren Winner and others who've kind of coached me in how to write about that. And, you know, Mary Carr in her book about writing memoir says, you should not write about anything that's less than eight years old. And I think she's so right because I tried, you know, but it I took agree. A long and it applies to preaching also, I think. Sure. Sure. You have to wait for a personal story that's painful. You have to give it time to heal so that people aren't worried about you in, yeah. in the midst of your telling it, you know? I think you're right. Yeah, I, I, I think that's amazing. So, so you go through this experience, though, and then because in some ways um, you, the pain you experience, the rejection you experience comes from the church, which is not yeah. where you expect to find it. And so you... Then go out, and I'm sorry, but you did. You went out and tried to find God in the sunset. And you know how I feel about that. I do. I'm not a I fan. Do. I do. I, anybody can find God in the sunset. But no, and I I mean, I remember when we talked about this book, I said, oh, gosh, you're not going to go write a Finding God in the Sunset book, are you? Um, but I love the way in which you couldn't leave your Christian formation behind you when you go on this journey. I mean, the fact that you are a deep Christian theologian um, goes with you on all mm -hmm. these expeditions. So if you were mad at the church, the church came with you and your formation. And, and I love the way in which you, you link the natural world together with the biblical texts and all of that. You weave that together. And I wonder how can we do a better job of that in the church? Oh my gosh. So many ways, Lillian. Uh, yeah. I, I can't quite shake my Christianity. Um, I I say this though that for so long, my self identity was, and you know, these are days when we're much more attuned to what's our identity. How do we identify ourselves? You know, and I identified myself as a Christian leader, as a pastor, as a preacher, as a theologian. Like that was how. I understood myself when I looked in the mirror, I was like, oh, I'm a, you know, that's what I was born to do. And um, it's interesting for me because that turned out not to be how other people saw me, honestly. I mean, you know that I was like in the running for a very big UCC job and a finalist for that and didn't get it even though I was told by the guy on the search, the chair of the search committee when he told me that he was releasing me from the from the search that I was the best preacher he's like you're by far the best preacher of our candidates but they just didn't and so what it was was they just didn't see me as a pastor as an you know I'm an enneagram 8 I'm like I I have a strong personality people have strong reactions to me they don't th see me or experience me as like a soft, empathetic, loving kind of person, even though, you know, if Courtney were to jump in here, she'd be 
that is who you are. You know, our spouses see in us things that others don't. Oftentimes, if we have good spouses, that's what they do. Um, so I had to stop seeing myself as a pastor because other people didn't see me as a pastor. I kept like applying for jobs I wasn't getting. And it was just that it was that people didn't see me as that. So then, but, but to your point, right. Then when I go outside and start spending time outside, I'm still relying on Christian resources. As you know, from the book, I, I, you know, I quote the Amas and Abbas of the fourth century desert. You know, I'm very reliant. Of, I'm so glad I found Rudolf Otto, the early 20th century Lutheran theologian who talks about the mysterium et tremendum, the, the mis mystery and terror that we have when we're confronted with the reality of God and, and our own creatureliness, he calls it, you know, and that it's reminding ourselves of our own creatureliness. How the church can do better? I mean, honestly, some of the criticisms I have of the church in the book are that um, we don't talk about death enough. Mm -hmm. um, we, I think, have fallen into the trap of modern American society of sanitizing death, of the the death happens in a hospital and then the body is taken in a back elevator to the basement of the hospital so that the funeral home can come and pick it up, pick up the body and then sneak it off in the dark of night and then burn it up. And then a lot of times we don't even have funerals. We have celebrations of life with no dead body present. And I've just become more and more, I mean, this is ancient stoicism, even the, the memento mori, like keep your mortality in front of you at all times and you will live a better life. And um, we certainly yeah. don't deal with it, honestly, when it comes to our food and our protein sources, right? Right. And so you know, I have, a, yeah, it can sort of, you know, is dies and then goes, crosses the rainbow bridge and comes back as a nugget, you know? I can't say that I agree with anything that your fellow Michigander Ted Nugent ever says, except when he says any American who eats meat should have to kill and dress out one chicken per year because it will make us a lot more attuned to where our food comes from and the life that was given for that food. And I have, we can t talk if you want, but I mean, I've, have strong feelings about vegetarianism either because that it, that also doesn't that's not solving any of the problem because i think the church should actually talk about the fact that we are apex predators and we're in a cycle of predation that we are implicated in every single day even 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 in the houses we build we are extirpating other species when we clear land and build a house when we clear land and build a runway for an airport like we everything we do as the, as the most invasive species ever on this planet has imp impacts and implications for so many other species so again all, i'm not saying oh my gosh we should fix it or we should all go live in huts and uh, i'm just saying in the church the church as a truth telling as, as supposedly a truth-telling institution in our culture should tell the truth about those kind of things in from the pulpit and say, okay, what are we going to do about this? Um, yeah. we, we all, a lot of us eat meat. Like our, our Lord ate, you know, we, Jesus ate fish on the beach in Luke 24. They gave him broiled fish and he ate it. He was not a vegetarian. Like, so let's, let's talk about this. All right, well, let's talk about it. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads or people um, who are listening. Shaking who fists. Wants, yeah, who wants to jump in and ask a question or make a comment? Oh, I see somebody with a hand. Shane, Shane Montoya. Hi there. Uh, so sorry I haven't read this book. It sounds like it just came out yesterday. Um, my favorite sermon I've ever preached was about Job um, and about God's reply to Job, um, that God is the, at least what I took from it is God is the God of the the mountain lion and the goat, the hunter and the hunted. Um, could you talk a little bit more? And, and my connection to that is that 
God is also wild and that we attempt to tame God so much. Could you talk about your, the connection between your finding spirituality in the wild and the and if you found wildness in, in God and in your experience of God? Yeah, yeah. Is that Shane? Did you say Shane? That that's a, that would be a great blurb for the back cover of my book, actually. So I'm sorry we didn't uh, I didn't get to you sooner, but yes, that's exactly what I'm writing about in the book that I've that that I have um, experienced God in wild places, and that God is, um, let's see, how would you say it? God is well. I already referred to Rudolf Otto, but God is the sublime god is that essence or force that we experience when we're in wild places that is so overwhelming that it causes mm -hmm. in us awe and a little bit of fear you know and draws us back again and again um and yeah one of the things i write in the book you know i grew up congregationalist my church wasn't growing up my church was one of the churches that refused to join the ucc because they didn't like the Sorry, sorry, district minister didn't like this synodical structure and was like, that's not congregationalists don't have synods and district ministers. So that's all right. You're dead to me now. <laughs> I know. Those are my grandparents. Don't it's it's the sin of my the <laughs> sin of my grandparents. They, We've got uh, some pastors from those NACC churches right here on the call. Yes, we love so everybody. <laughs> I was an I was an N.A. kid growing up and I, our youth group was even called Pilgrim Fellowship, which was what all the N.A. churches used to call their uh, youth groups and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in our reform tradition, we are liter What's the Presbyterian Book of Order say that worship should be done decently and in order? And, you know, I grew up in a sanctuary that was all right angles and the the red carpeting down the center aisle was had perfect lines from the vacuum cleaner every sunday morning you know every the the altar ta the the i mean that we didn't have an altar because we were very congregationalist so the communion table was at a perfect right angle everything's at right angles and that worked for me i think when my life was order was decent and in order and when my life became broken and hurting, I looked around and I'm like, there's no right angles in my life. The, the, the things aren't going the way. This is a crooked road, you know? And when you go out into the wild, whether you don't have to carry a gun with you or even a fishing pole, you can just go on a hike, you know, or whatever. What What do you see? You know, there's no right angles in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Think, things are crooked and tangled and thorny and there's dead trees lying on the ground and out of those dead trees is growing, you know, moss and mushrooms and a billion insects. And maybe the, the shoot of the next tree growing out of the hummus of the dead tree. And I'm like, this is more like some of life. our churches have that stuff growing in them. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Black mold. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I just, yeah. to Shane's point, I, yes. I find that I'm like, I like that God. I like the God of wild places, hence the name of the book. This God who's who's a little bit scary, who's who isn't decent and in order. Well, fear. I mean, fear is a big part of your yeah. description of God in this, not fear in a bad way, but fear like awe, like yeah. like the the moment of not knowing if you're going to find the shoreline and being lost in the water, you experience fear, but there is an openness to the power of God in that where we're not in charge. We're not vacuuming the rugs, right? We're just floating on the water. Um, we have a great question though, that I got in the chat. Shannon Jamal Hallman's one of our pastors um, has a question for you about how, how you bring your spirituality and prayer life into the moment of, of killing an animal. Shannon, why don't you say more about your question? It's a great one. Sure. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, my I didn't grow up in a hunting uh, family either, but my husband did. And so um, since getting married the last 26 years, I have become a woman who processes meat <laughs> when he takes it home because he's a firm believer, too, that um, we don't just kill merely for sport, but for um, providing for our families. So I was wondering a few of any practices or any rituals that you do in the process of hunting. Uh, is there a prayer you say or um a meditation process you use while you're dressing the animal in the field? That's a great question, Shannon. And I appreciate you mentioning that. I I'll just tell you first before that I had a very profound experience a few weeks ago in that I, um, I went with a friend of mine to a, a pheasant hunting conference and I picked him up at his house and I gave his his wife asked for a copy of the book and I gave it to her and she's a 55 year old suburban white evangelical woman and I'd say that's probably not my as far as my publisher's concerned probably not my target audience of my book and uh, when we got back a few days later Mark was unloading his stuff out of my truck and she came out of the house and said she'd read the whole book over the weekend and started talking about my chapter called Meat, in which I write very, very vividly about the process of butchering a deer. And she started crying. And it, almost exactly like you, she, I'm not, she says, I'm not a hunter, but Mark obviously is. I've eaten a ton of venison. And to read the process, because what I write about in the book is the pro, how I am an agent in the process of changing that being from a deer to venison. But like so many things in the spiritual life, there's this liminal time where it's neither deer nor venison. I don't even know, and I talk about this in the book, I don't even know quite what pronouns to use because when I'm when I'm killing or butcher, and I, first of all, I do not use euphemisms. I'm I'm don't harvest an animal. I kill animals. And then I butcher them and then I eat them. So I'd really try to avoid euphemisms in general in life, per, for sure in my writing, but absolutely because I want, I, people are very uncomfortable with the fact of me saying that I kill animals, but, but that's what I do. So I'm not going to try to sand off the sharp edges of that, but there's the, and, and then I'm the agent in changing it from a her. And she even said to me, the, this woman, Patty said to me, like, even the fact that it was a doe a female deer was, was so powerful. Um, so changing it from a, from a her to an it, because when you're looking at a venison steak in the fridge and pulling it out to put on the grill, you don't say, I'm going to put her on the grill. You know, you say, I put, I'm going to put it on the grill. Like, so the, 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 even, and this is of course something we're thinking a lot about culturally right now is pronouns. So this me being the agent in this process of changing it from a her to an it and, things like that. These are all, these have become very profound moments for me. So yes, there are a few different prayers that I've used. I mean, I, I don't, I can't recite them off the top of my head, but like I've got it. There's a Celtic prayer for hunters that I've used in the past. I write in the book about um, St. Hubert and I'm happy to send any of these to you too. Um, and I should Absolutely. probably just like put them, make them available on my website, but um Yes, and for sure in the moment of, of after killing, especially a mammal like a deer, it's a little harder when you're bird hunting and you shoot three or four or five in a day. Then it's more like at the end of the day, I try to, but, but you know, I only shoot one or two deer per year. And then I, yes, always, always silence moment, lay hand on the deer, pray thankful to the deer. And this uh, last thing I'll say about this is uh, I, I, I write about this in the book that I interviewed two different people on my podcast and it blew my mind because I blew, I, 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 I interviewed a Catholic priest and I then interviewed a trans man hunter and they each said virtually the same thing about I experience the deer giving itself her or himself to me before I take the shot. And they have, they give, they, they 
it, it challenged me so much because they gave the, they each gave the deer so much agency in this relationship of the, 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 the hunting and the killing and the eating of it. And they and it, it just increased their thankfulness to the deer by giving. And I'm like, can you really give a deer agency? And, I, and then it just had challenged me. So I've tried to do a lot to be more aware of that and, and try to take that into account during my hunting. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, I think, um, and yes, we have a question from Mary Beth. We are going to come to, but I, I recall getting an opportunity to interview, um, a, a Jewish writer who was talking about these same questions and saying that, you know, in the tradition of keeping kosher and how the Jewish people will work with meat and butcher it in particular ways, he was saying those ancient practices bring us back to that respect for the animal, et cetera. And they had a gathering where there were vegetarians at the gathering and meat eaters at the gathering. And they did a sacrifice of a goat um, together in the Jewish mm. tradition, like an ancient sacrifice. And then they prepared the goat together and then they ate it. And he, he said, I'll never forget it. He said, the, the carnivores had enormous trouble eating the goat be mm. because they hadn't experienced all that. But interestingly, some of the vegetarians were able to eat the goat because of wow. that. And I just thought that was powerful. Okay, Mary Beth has a question for you. Um, more, more statement. I was really moved by the way you see said, it is different. Uh, you think of meat differently. This I'm paraphrasing it. Um, you think of meat differently when you know how it is dressed. Because until the time I was 50 almost, I lived in suburban Chicago or suburban Washington. And when you got a duck, you went to the Dominic's or the Kroger or the Jewel and picked it out of the um, refrigerator or freezer and took it home. But our first, my first call was in a very rural area where all the 12 year olds, girls and boys got a rifle when they were 12. Uh, and so living in this community for five years, I learned that there were eggs were different colors than brown and white by heritage chickens. We were often invited during deer season to someone's house for venison. And I learned about meat lockers and people also, you know, why you could only take so many deer a year. And I was, I was present when at a meat locker, when the husband of a parishioner dropped off a deer and they said, do you want a tour? And I couldn't say no, but it really made me think differently of, and also people would drop off duck and pheasant. It was rural Nebraska mm -hmm. uh, as, as gifts to us. Um, so I think now we, PL used to, my husband used to cook duck on New Year's Eve. And now we have uh, a pasta from the Moosewood, Sundays at the Moosewood, which is a lacto-vegetarian dish because um, it's when you, when we would know, or have met the animal that was sometimes a gift for dinner, it, it, it just makes you think differently about them. And also um, how, how I think it's a crime actually to like raise hogs in one of those swine confines. There were several mm. of them in our neighborhood. So, yeah. so I am very interested in reading your book. And my question was, where can I get it? Oh, ah, God of wild ah, okay. places, so, God of wild so, places .com. God of wild places okay. .com. I want it that that I want to read. I, I just want to read you a very brief. Let me see how quickly I can find it here. I should be able to find it quickly. Um, here we go. This is a funny academic book. Um, and let's see, page fifty six. Uh, you guys ready for this? It's yeah. called, um, God. Nimrod and the world, because I don't know if you remember you. I don't know if you've ever preached on Nimrod, but Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord in Genesis. And uh, so this is a funny, this is a collection and very academic book. Um, uh, and, but there's an essay in here um, about now who's the, who was the like, brother of Gregory of Nazianzus and was known for a, a, as a great hunter in the early Eastern. That's kind of beside the point. Here's how Stephen Webb, 
who's a now deceased uh, theologian, but was a vegetarian. But he writes in this book about hunting. And he writes, um, not only he writes, ethical hunting is surely one of the most singular expressions of human uniqueness. But then he, this is how he closes this essay. This suggests that the vegetarian and the hunter are moral companions in their treatment of animals. Vegetarians and hunters, unlike consumers of industrialized agricultural products, both acknowledge that humans have the power of life and death over animals and that choosing to take an animal's life should be done in a way that does not make beasts of men. Pardon the masculine mm -hmm. language there at the end, but I'll give him a pass because he's deceased. But so even this vegetarian Christian theologian is saying the, the, the five percent of Americans who hunt and the whatever it is, it's less than ten percent of Americans who are vegetarians. That let's call it fifteen percent of Americans have more in common than the other eighty-five percent of Americans who just eat industrialized meat wrapped in saran wrap at your at your local supermarket. So I just love that you, as when you were a pastor in that rural community, that you leaned into that. You know, because I think some of us who are in ministry and come from more urban contexts like like I do when we're assigned and Lily and I saw you do this even in Iowa like when you're assigned to a more rural kind of setting you can go into it one of two ways like I'm better than these people I'm so much more sophisticated and you know wow I would never you know eat a eat deer you know or whatever or you can be like oh my gosh what am I what have I been missing and how can I learn how these why there are some eggs that are purple and green uh, and not just white and brown, this kind of thing. I love it. I love it. For all of a sudden, so many parables make sense if you spend time in rural or hunting communities, like the sheep and the goats and finding out that actually the goats were the smart animals, you know, that, yeah. that goats lead sheep and things like that, that I, you know, I realized I've been preaching on these things completely wrong based on like one trip to a petting zoo <laughs> that traumatized me in the fourth grade. And then you get to be yeah. with sh sheep farmers and you learn about Well, stuff. and Lillian, you and I, I mean, one of the more um, meaningful experiences of my life and not necessarily in a good way is you and I spent a day in a chicken kill plant in Bentonville, Arkansas. And we saw the, 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 what would you say the efficiency and precision with which human beings kill chickens and and clean them and butcher them and clean them it it was in, it was incredible and of course it's hidden from 99% of american consumers how that happens yeah we were part of a group that was looking at theology and christian um way of life and so ethical concerns so we end up at the tyson chicken plant and i mean that was that was fascinating to be sort of forcing ourselves to watch that process and spend a day on in the slaughter and watching all that. Um, but also I would say equally traumatic was the fact that we went to the CEO's office and it was an exact replica of the White House Oval Office <laughs> in a chicken was, plant. Okay, that was so weird. weird. Was so you can't weird. make this stuff up. But um, <laughs> so I want to take us back there. There's so much good stuff in here, but I, I don't want to go away from where we started, which is I think... Anybody who loves the outdoors will enjoy this. And this would be a great book study for a church. Tony's going to come do an in-person event here in a month um, at the beginning of May that we'll let you know about. Jen, I see those hands. Yeah. But I want to <laughs> go back to, because we do have a lot of pastors on this call, um, the fact that it is hard to be um, a public leader in the church and to go through a trauma or a rejection or a shunning. Um, and in the question comes up for pastors all the time is um, we preach forgiveness mm -hmm. and we preach that you should share with your community and the community will come around you. But often the model for the pastor is you need to go out in the woods by yourself and get over it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't think that's all wrong. I mean, I do. If somebody were coming to me and saying this is happening to me, I would say, don't read any emails for the next forty-eight hours, and probably whatever the big kerfluffle is, if you just let the dust settle, go like 
put, throw a tent in the back of your car, go find a state park and like sleep under the stars for a couple nights. Cause when you come back, not only will you have gained some perspective, but probably other the people involved in the kerfuffle will be like, well, it's not that maybe they will have sorted it out in your absence. And, you know, I look back, mine was very public and very on the internet and people were trying to take me down. And it, it was just an, imp you remember this Lillian, it was just an impossible situation. Like, do I respond or do I, um, ignore it? And if I ignore it, people say that I'm, not dealing with the accusations. And if I defend myself, people say, see, we knew he was a narcissist. Only narcissists defend themselves like that. You know, it's just like it's a no win. And and a lot of us in pastoral leadership meeting uh, uh, leadership roles, whether we're leading it in a in, in a parish context or we're at a broader statewide context or we're, you know, I don't know what whatever it may be. It, it all feels the same and it just feels it frankly just feels shitty. And it's very hard to keep your bearings when assaults are coming. Um, so and I think I, as pastors, yeah. it, it is different, though, because we are in a fishbowl, you know, if you are yeah. a pastor. And so it and I think also, though, there is something um, a little bit dysfunctional about how we're training our pastors that. uh that as pastors, we don't get to express pain and hurt when people mm -hmm. are unkind to us. And I think we should, by the way, I'm not in favor of that. But when I went through a, a similar situation to what Tony's experiencing and kind of 10 years ago, my sort of being outside of the system in the wilderness and, and not experiencing the church in the ways I had wanted it to be or what have you, um, I'll ultimately come back to it, right? Because I, I still believe it's it's people in the church. And what I found, though, was that um, people outside the church during that time of my wandering uh, were genuinely kind. And also that a lot of people in churches have received the message from us as pastors because we're not vulnerable, that they can't be vulnerable. It's like this mm -hmm. dysfunctional system that we're a part of as pastors mm -hmm. And then we don't receive forgiveness and mercy. We just, they, people just want you to go away because you know what? Everybody's run a stop sign hmm. and didn't get a ticket. And then if they see someone over here getting a ticket, they want to, you know, put some distance yeah. there, right? Yeah. But I think that, you know, to break these things open with conversations like we have here about our humanity is is so important. And, and also though, that there are faithful, good people in our churches, but it's interesting that they take you out duck hunting to have the conversation. Yeah. And maybe that is how it works. You know, maybe it doesn't all yeah. happen in the building, right? Yeah. But well, I, yeah, I just, I, I wrote an, I wrote another essay that's going to appear online at, uh, I think this week at some point, but, and I wrote the essay called the, the, the sacred geometry of a canoe. And there's something about a canoe. Uh, I mean, my wife kind of gives me grief about it. I think she thinks it's because I'm an Enneagram eight. I think maybe it's because I'm, you know, a, a traditional guy. And sometimes I, I don't make perfect eye contact when I'm having very intense conversations. I kind of break eye contact and look around and it drives her a little bit crazy when we're at a restaurant or whatever. <laughs> but the canoe is perfect because you can have these very intimate conversations and you're just looking at the back of someone's head you know you're in this they're like what what else in life is there other than like a canoe or a two-person kayak where you're both facing the same direction but you're in this quiet environment you can have these very intense conversations while you're you know paddling in the same direction i love it and and so i've had like some of the most intense conversations of my life in a canoe when i'm actually not it's not like when you're in a coffee shop and you're looking at your friend or even when you're at a theater and you're next to each other or whatever. You're just pulling in the same direction, literally, with your paddles and having this conversation while you're going across a lake. And and I you know, tell a story about getting in a canoe with a buddy of mine. And we started as acquaintances. And two hours later, at the other end of the lake, when we're getting out to Portage, we are now deep friends. We've already like... We've talked about our divorces and remarriages, parenting our kids, that our our fathers dying, that we're taking care of aging mothers. Like we we've shared everything in these two hours of paddling, and it's just I love it. So right. yeah, well, right there is something the church can learn from 
everything we do in the church is based on like an academic model of learning where the teacher stands up here and talks and then the students sit still and listen. And then we wonder why like it's not an open community of sharing, right? With everybody sitting still the whole time in those chairs like that. And the reality is for so many of us, I relate to this very strongly, we relate by doing something else. Like my most miserable thing is to have to sit through a long dinner with somebody. I, I like to do something. And, Especially when fish know. is being served. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and I think in the church, we are so locked into that academic, yeah. old fashioned model of how people interact or communicate. And just the, I, and I think it's part of why kids and grownups love mission trips so much and building houses you know, it's not an efficient way to provide housing for people in other countries, right. but it's probably a helpful way for us to have community with each other and with God. Like, let's be honest about let's it. Let's be honest. Yeah. And it's why it's why taking kids on a canoe trip to the Boundary Waters or taking them out to Colorado to climb mountains. Yeah, these are the ways when people have, I mean, I was a youth pastor, as you already mentioned, for a long time. And and there's it, it's no surprise that doing things like this change kids' lives. You know, you it, we used to have this thing, and you know that that the one week on the mission trip was had far more impact than the other fifty one weeks of youth group and Sunday school and everything else we did. Um, so if you could just get the kid on that one week of that intense experience, you have the opportunity to really. Mm -hmm. help shape that kid and and get that adolescent to start to think about issues of faith and and life and ethics and now and I was you know I was a youth pastor before the age of the mobile phone and so now it's even more even more important to get kids away from their phones and yeah. out into the wild places yeah and the grown-ups and the grown-ups and the grown-ups and the well, grown -ups. there's yeah there's so much good stuff in here including i have to mention one of the most beautiful chapters is the one called companions oh. which is about um tony's dog and you can read that if you feel like crying um <laughs> and tony is a dog person i'm just going to say that up front and um <laughs> even though I am working very hard to elevate cats to the status of clergy in the Michigan <laughs> conference um, right now. But the I think the story about the dogs is in some ways an example of what we could be to each other in the church too, is hmm. that kind of love and faithfulness and fidelity. Um, I'm going to close us with a prayer so we can let people go after that, but then we can stay on and chat a little bit, all of us who want to. Gracious God, we ask your blessing upon us. We give you thanks for the wisdom of our speaker, Tony. We ask that you bless him with the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to teach and to preach in all spaces in your glorious creation. We thank you for the gathering today and the ways in which we have heard your voice through one another. We ask a blessing upon all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. I, before you go, come here, Crosby. Oh, is that Crosby? That's Crosby. Here's Crosby. <laughs> <laughs>